If your head is spinning by now, I know exactly how you feel. Coffee keeps me upright. Now, um, Warren was asking um, more about that, that violin plot again, and um, Lauren was so kind to show us how it actually works. I've put this into, into code snips. You need two libraries. Some of you might have the libraries installed already, ggplot and reshape. Um, the box plot <coughs> of, of the data looks like that. Um, we've looked at the histograms before, they're multimodal distributions. And in order to put it into a format that ggplot likes, uh, we use the melt function from the reshape package. Um, it basically takes all of the columns, um, defines each column as a factor, and puts the columns one after another into the same column. And then it can create a plot from that an abstract plot and it can add the violin aesthetics and that's what what that looks like so this is a violin plot and you can you can kind of appreciate that this is conceptually similar to the box plot but it's richer in in, in data and I've put that into code snips <clears throat> We're moving on to, to the second great topic of the workshop. The first one was just an introduction to exploratory data analysis. Um, we'll be getting a little more quantitative now with regression analysis. So the concept of regression is essentially to explore, quantitatively explore correlations in the data. And we've kind of vaguely looked at the scatter plots before, we've seen that some of the data is correlated and we, we, can, we can say that that is meaningful in a sense. If we see correlations in biological data, it often means that one causes the other or it means that both are caused by something independently which acts on both. Or it can mean that this is just a random chance correlation. Um, <clears throat> Sometimes the task is important to figure it out, but guilt by association, seeing that two things vary in the same way, um, often tells us something useful or creates useful hypotheses about mechanisms that underlie our data in the first place. So if you, um, all of you should have updated and, and pulled the latest version from, from the repository to make sure that what you have here is actually the latest file of the REDA regression unit. So if you find REDA regression in your files pane and click on that, this will put you here. We're talking about regression. And before we talk about regression, we need to think about correlation. What does correlation mean? When is data correlated? How do we calculate correlations and what do the different correlation values mean when we see them? So let's, let's play with the data and let's look at that. So we'll take uh, 50 <clears throat> random deviates from a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. This is this R norm 50. And we assign that to X. And same thing for Y. And if we plot the two against each other, this is something that, by definition, should be random. We've taken random values in x, and we've taken random values in y, so there should be no similarity between, or no, no significant influence of x and y, because they were independently taken from a random or a, a pseudo-random distribution. Now, the way to calculate the correlation, the degree to which one set of deviates depends on the other set of deviates, is simply with COR. So this calculates the so-called Pearson correlation of two values. 
And as we see, the Pearson correlation between x and y is a very small number. Um, now, if on the other hand, we now reassign y to actually be x. So it's, now y is the same value as x. So what does the plot look like? y is the same value as x. We plot that as a scatter plot. Everything is on a diagonal. Right? Whatever the x value is, the i value is the same thing. The x value is still random, but the i value is the same value as, as x. So, um, what's the correlation of that? Well, the correlation of that is plus 1, exactly 1. <coughs> If we would go and say y is minus x, and then plot that, the distribution looks like this, and the correlation is minus 1. So correlation, Pearson correlation can take values between minus 1 if something is un anti-correlated, i.e. an increase in one value means a decrease in the other value and vice versa. Via zero, if there's no correlation and, and a change in one variable does not have anything to do with the change in the other variable, to a maximum of plus one, which means they're perfectly correlated, an increase in the value of x definitely means an increase um, in the value of y by um, uh, some, some linearly scaled factor. Now, <clears throat> what we're trying to figure out when we look at correlations is, is there a significant influence? So as we go from minus 1 to 0 to plus 1, at some point, our belief that this is meaningful, that the correlation is meaningful, is going to deteriorate and we'll say, you know, at first, yeah, this looks good, this doesn't look as good, and, and then we say, this is really bad, this, these two val values have nothing to do with each other. But where do we draw the line? What does that even look like? So let's try to develop a little bit of an intuition here. So um, I'll do, I'll, I'll write a little function here, um, plot correlation, which takes, <coughs> Um, which takes some values x and a portion of noise, which I call r. So we compute y as values that are to r parts, simply x, and to 1 minus r parts, random noise. Right? So um, we're looking at the intermediate states here of going from the uncorrelated to the correlated in small steps of in-between. So we calculate the noise as the same length of x, and then um, uh, we plot these things together. So initially, we start with 50 normally distributed values of x, and and run this plot core plot. You see that there's a slight deviation here, right? 99% um, of what we see here is y equals x, and 1% noise is, has been added. So something like that is almost indistinguishable from 1. It's 0 0.99999, a super high correlation. Oh. Oh. Sorry. So if we go to 90%, it gets a little you know, more spread out. But the correlation coefficient still is crystal clear, 0 0.996, very similar to 1. At 80%, so adding now 20% of noise to this, we still have 0 0.97. So it doesn't start deteriorating very rapidly. This is still an extremely high correlation. Of course, looking at it, you would, you would say, there's, there's obviously uh, these two 
um, deviates are varying in the same sense. 40% of noise. It's a, it gets a lot more spread out. Um, this is a correlation coefficient of 50%. So at 40% of noise, um, <clears throat> sorry, 60% of noise, 40% of x value, 60% of noise, um, it turns out that we have about a correlation coefficient of 50%. This is still quite good. If you have correlation coefficients of 50%, uh, in your data analysis, you can pat yourself on your shoulder because you've probably found something um, that that is interesting. Well, and then you know if we if we get to have less and less, um, this is now almost uncorrelated. 99% um, noise. Um, the correlation coefficient is a small value. In this case, it turns out to be minus 0.13. Repeat that, it's minus 0.10. Repeat that again, minus 0.16. So there's still you know, some, something going on here, but um, correlation coefficients of around 10% or 20% are really indistinguishable from random situations. <clears throat> now, something that we ne need to note, however, is that correlation, Pearson correlation, has, is defined and calculated with reference to a linear correlation. And if our values are not linear, we can have very low correlations for very good, uh, very strong dependencies. So <clears throat> remember, if we, when, when we look at uh, 10% noise, we get correlation coefficients around 0.99. So let's look at 10% noise, but now we don't use a linear function, um, but we use um, a trigonometric function, a cosine function. You see here? So it goes down, it goes up, it goes down, it goes up. It's the same, same thing, super high um, dependency of one value on the other, but with a different functional form. What does the correlation coefficient go do? Boom, it goes to nothing, 0.07. So if you look at the data, you'll immediately realize, you know, if your data looks like that, you've discovered something. But if you only see the correlation coefficient, you might think there's nothing there, there's no correlation there. There's no linear correlation here. But it doesn't mean that the data are not mutually dependent. So polynomials, this is a quadratic function. Again, we go down to a range of non-significance. Exponential, here the correlation is a little bit higher because you can imagine that we can kind of fit a line through this and still get you know, lots of residuals but, but still kind of a, um, a significant description. Of course, 0.69 is higher than nothing, but it's far away from the 99% of correlation that we would otherwise um, find. Or if we have something circular, um, again, it goes to nothing. So in all of these cases, there's a clear functional relationship um, it should have yielded a correlation coefficient around 0.99, but not a linear correlation, which turns out to be much lower. So you have to be a little bit careful about how your data is structured. <clears throat> now let's stay with linear modeling for a moment and um, try to, to uh, figure out if we have a scatter plot of data and the data is linearly correlated. Um, how can we figure out what the parameters of that functional dependence are? So the, the task here is to take data and fit a line to the data and calculate the slope and the intercept of that line to characterize the trend in our data. <clears throat> of course, we could just take that function and apply it to our, um, some of the, one of the data sets that we've seen, you know, pull out something from um, the graft versus host disease or, or the um, lipopolysaccharide stimulated data, but that would actually be an error. 
when we, when we do quantitative analysis on data with simple or more sophisticated tools, the golden rule is always do this on synthetic data first. You have to synthesize your data in a way where it is similar to what your measurement looks like, but also in a way where you know the parameters that you're trying to find. Then you apply your analysis. Then you figure out, did you recover the parameters that you put into your model? If you applied an analysis to synthetic data and you were not able to recover the parameters of how you synthesize the data, there's no way that somehow magically the same analysis will give you the correct results on real data. So that's really important. You have to tune and hone your analysis in a way where you first apply it to synthetic data. So <clears throat> here's a very simple uh, code that generates um, a model of height and weight of humans. So we, we all know that as we as humans grow taller, we also get heavier. Sometimes we get heavier without growing taller, but that's for different reasons. But there's also a big distribution here. So we'll take 50 values. Um, we'll say that our minimum height is 1 meter and 50. That's a not very tall person. Our maximum height is um, uh, 2.3 meters. This guy is probably playing for um, the raptors. Um, and we build a data frame <clears throat> with 50 rows of heights and weights. And then we generate a column of numbers in the interval. So here we don't use our norm but we use our unif. This is not run if, this is our unif, our uniform. Random data from a uniform distribution. So simply random numbers somewhere in the interval of heights. And then we generate a column of weights, which are correlated to that, with a linear model where we say um, the weight of a human being is 40 times the height plus one plus some random noise. So if somebody is two meters tall, they would weigh 80 kilos plus one, 81 kilos in this model here, um, plus some random noise depending on whether they work out or, or not. Actually, both of which would make them heavier. Um, <clears throat> Right, so we have heights, we have weights, and we can plot what we get here. So you kind of see the trend. If you reproduce this, this should look exactly the same, even though we've used random numbers. Why? Because of this here, set seed. Short uh, digression into set seed, and why set seed is also really important when you simulate data. So random numbers in computers are not really random, usually not, uh, unless we have special hardware to create real random numbers. Random numbers in computers are so-called pseudo-random numbers. They are generated with an intelligent algorithm which spits out data according to some distribution or just uniform random data um, that is as unpredictable as possible and as close as possible in statistical properties to true randomness. But it's an algorithm. If I repeat the algorithm to generate these pseudo-random numbers with the same starting value, I will get the same pseudo-random numbers. And that's important to realize because that allows us to take random numbers that are always the same when we repeat something. And if we develop an algorithm <clears throat> that depends on some kind of randomness, it's actually important to be able to troubleshoot it to make it reproducible. So let me illustrate that briefly. Set C.
Ähm, Sample 1 to 5 will permute the vector 1 to 5. 1, 3, 2, 5, 4. One four three two five. Four one five two three. Um, <clears throat> so I get a different permutation every single time, depending on the random number generator. Now if I set seed to say um, three one four one. Um, and I sample 1 to 5, at first I don't notice anything different. 4, 5, 1, 3, 2. 5, 4, 2, 3, 1. But if I reset the seed to that number, I get 4, 5, 1, 3, 2. 5, 4, 2, 3, 1. And again, 4, 5, 1, 3, 2. Five, four, two, three, one. So it's always the same, but it's still random. From that point on, the random number generator just does its thing, but when I reset it with set seed, it goes back into the same state over and over again. Does it matter what number you use in the seed? Uh, not really. You can use any, any integer that is smaller than the largest integer. Um, I end up using one one two three five eight a lot. <laughs> Fibonacci numbers, I kind of like that. Sometimes I use three one four one five nine. Uh, you can use one. There's actually, if you if you care to look for it, somebody did an analysis of random number seeds on GitHub. Um, you can you can web scrape GitHub and. Um, they um, and 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 download the code that is the R code that's posted on GitHub and then just you know parse it and find whenever people set random seeds and, and figure out what that number is. Um, it's actually don't say some people just have too much time. It's actually a a nice exercise for for data analysis on a large scale. And they found that you know one two three is very common. One is very common. 42 is very common, which is predictable. Not so many people use one, one, two, three, five, but I'm sure many. Yeah? What's the default behavior if you don't set a seed? <clears throat> if you don't set a seed, um, the algorithm set seed is run when you start R um, with something that guarantees to give you um, some randomness. Where that randomness comes from is operating system dependent. Um, there's, there's a machine dependent random number generator which I think is then used as a seed to simply make sure that if you don't set the seed you really do get different results. Um, I don't know how it works on every operating system, at least on Linux operating systems the machine collects something called entropy which is which is a long vector depending on what's uh, displayed on the screen and how you use your mouse and uh, timing of system interrupts and so on. And, 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 and that's collected. We actually had an absolutely interesting case at one point where an algorithm started to fail on a server because the random number generator didn't work anymore. And after much troubleshooting, we found that the reason was that we had, the server was just running, and we had disconnected the mouse and the keyboard, because you know, it's a server. And since there was no more mouse and keyboard input, literally, the machine had run out of entropy. The entropy file on the machine to generate random numbers, which was required for some system library to run, had been exhausted. 
And that system function didn't run anymore because there was no more entropy in the system. Great kudos to my, my assistant at that time, um, who actually was able to troubleshoot and find out what's happened. I'm absolutely fascinated. A computer that runs out of entropy, who would have thought? So in most studies, people will use algorithms that are not based on you know, something in their computer, but possibly some mathematical constants or something like that, or what? Have we found the optimal random number generator yet? The optimal random number generator is true randomness. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little hardware device that actually generates true random numbers. Um, you can do this with radioactive decay. Um, you can also use do this with uh, uh, quantum randomness with a, with a very sensitive device. And these things exist. You can, you can buy a little USB thing that you stick into your computer, which generates true random numbers. I always thought I'd, at some point I'd like to geek out and have one of these. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so that exists. That said, the actual random numbers that we use in R and, and in other applications are very, very good. So they are really, really quite indistinguishable. Now, something you can't do with a true random number generator is to repeat your randomness if you want to repeat your, your analysis. In the, in the code that uh, I use here, I actually need it repeatable because, you know, for some things, I just need the same thing to appear on your screen as on my screen. And if I use any kind of sample or uh, R norm or whatever, we need to start from the same point. All right. Back from randomness and the set C. So this is the plot, and, and all our plots probably should look pretty much the same. And let's, cal let's calculate the correlation here, and it's 0.54, which tells me, indeed, um, <clears throat> there's probably something significant. As the height increases, um, the weight increases as well, which um, could be a causal correlation, or it could be um, due to a confounding factor. Now, very simple to calculate a so-called linear model, i.e. calculate which line would pass through that data and best explain it. This is a linear model. Uh, this is just LM, linear model, where the function call is weights, heights, and the two things together with a tilde. This is not a minus sign. This is the squiggly character that lives on the top left of your keyboard. The tilde, T-I-L-D-E. Squiggle. How do you call this? Does anybody call it tilde? Anybody call it different? Hmm? Good. So. Be careful. Don't, don't uh, read this as a minus sign. It's not a minus sign. <coughs> and um, if we calculate that, um, this is what we get. It returns the actual call of the formula. LM formula is whites tilde heights. And the coefficients it returns is an intercept of minus 3 and um, heights of 42.9. What do these numbers mean? How did they relate to our question? What did we even ask? We were asking if we create a synthetic data set with a specific parameter. Can we then analyze it? Sample it, then analyze it, and get that back out. Exactly. So <clears throat> we created the synthetic data set in a particular way as a linear model. We said, take an x value, multiply it by 40, add 1, add some noise. And that means this multiply it by 40 and add 1 should come out of our analysis. So did it? Mm, ish. Ish, yeah, kind of. You know, We got 42 with the amount of noise that that uh, that's in there. Um, this is actually pretty good. If we run this many, many different times um, with different seeds, um, this is actually one of the better examples. 
It just turned out that way. I, I didn't actually fake it that way. Even though I didn't use 11358, but 83 is a C. Um, <clears throat> minus 3 is not very different from 1 in, in the general scope of things here, if we look at the intercept. Um, so the numbers relate to our question because they are the parameters of a linear model which we use to generate the data in the first place. Is the estimate any good? Yeah, pretty good. Um, let's plot a regression line. Um, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a function that um, we use frequently to draw lines on plots, a, b line. Um, it can be called in different ways, a, b line, um, is often called by just giving a parameter A for the slope and a parameter B for the intercept. Um, you can also use it to have horizontal lines or vertical lines on a plot. Uh, if I want a horizontal line, I say AB line H equals something. If I want a vertical line, AB line V equals something. Um, you'll recognize that I, I, I use that in code from time to time. But in, in the general uh, case here, um, it can take the output of a linear model directly and do something with it. And um, it plots the so-called um, regression line. So what is this line? It's a nice line we, we draw through the data, but what does it mean that this line is nice? There's a mathematical interpretation why this line is, is fitted in exactly this way. And <clears throat> the mathematical interpretation is that basically the points on the line would predict where the values were if this were a perfect correlation. But there are so-called residuals. The actually observed values are different from the predicted values. And the line is built in such a way that the squared sum of the residuals becomes as small as possible. This is why this is called a linear least squares fit. It finds a line that makes the, the square of the residuals as small as possible. To calculate the residuals, um, <clears throat> we use the function resid. Store that. If we calculate uh, the idealized values, um, we use the function fitted. And then we can use segments to plot the differences. So the intercepts of the line would be where the prediction would fall. Um, the length of the line is, is the, the height of the residuals. Now, if the fit is any good, that's actually interesting. The correlation of the residuals should be zero or close to zero. If the correlation of the, the residuals is close to zero, it means there's no extra information in the residuals that we need to take into account. In the case that a linear model does not explain our data well, for example, because it's a sine wave or, or it's a quadratic function or an exponential function, then there would be remaining correlation in the residuals. We can't remove all the correlation with a single um, plot here. So if we plot fit against residual, we get this here. Is this random? Well, the coefficient of correlation now is Minus 1 to 10 to minus 16, which is very, 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 very close to 0. There are two other uh, concepts that apply here. <clears throat> and these are prediction and confidence limits. So prediction limits give the boundaries on future observations. Um, they characterize how well the model is expected to accommodate new, new data. Um, <clears throat> so basically, um, 
the prediction limits tell us where would we expect the new point that we haven't observed yet to fall. The confidence limits give us uh, bounds on, since our data is noisy, we might expect that our linear model can also lie slightly differently, this way or that way, be moved up or down or twisted left or right. And what are the bounds in which our model could lie? So we'll, we'll illustrate this. <clears throat> so this, these are points. They tell us the fitted value and the lower and upper bounds of where the, where the confidence limits are. Um, depending on, on the order of the x values, um, the, the values are like 60, 67, 92, 76, so they basically go up and down. So in order to plot that as a, as a line, we need to sort that first. We use order. <clears throat> Yeah. So the residual basically says if we take an x value and we multiply it by forty two something and then we subtract minus 2.9 um, that's the prediction of if that linear model were true where that value would fall but it doesn't actually our observation is somewhere different and the difference between the predicted value i.e. a point on the regression line and the actual observed value that's the residual the residual is the difference between a point on the line and the actually observed value so basically, um, the length of these red segments here, these are the residuals. <clears throat> now, if all of the trend, if all of the functional relationship between our data points have been explained well enough by that linear model, then the only thing that the linear model does not explain is the random noise. And random noise should have a correlation around zero. Right? So we expect that the lengths of these residuals have a correlation of zero. And as we see, that's actually the case. Now, if the correlation is not zero, but there is some residual value there, um, that would mean that um, we have only explained part of the correlation in the data with a linear model. We might need a second um, linear model to explain some more. Uh, for example, if this is an exponential distribution, there would be one best line and then one second best line, and you know you can add more and more lines, and uh, it will become more random. But you will never explain all of the trend away. Yeah. Um, kind of related to that. Um, so here you're starting with the assumption that you have a linear model and you're carrying out your correlation. And yeah. Look, looking to see if you have a uh, minimized residual. Yeah. Um, but would you alternately uh, or additionally kind of try, for example, the exponential um, correlation or other, and then in those cases look for residual to see if you know that reveals whether your assumption of using a linear regression is correct, as opposed to, for example, if the exponential gives you a reduced residual, maybe that's the better way to go. Yeah. Is that well, that's, that's, that's really very difficult because um, the linear model is basically the, the, the smallest possible model that, that, that we can apply, and, and Occam's razor tells us that that's a good idea. 
altern alternate functional forms, well, there's arbitrarily many that we can use. We can use hypergeometrics, and we can use exponentials, and polynomial functions, and trigonometric functions, and there are very, very large books that contain all possible functions that we could use. If we use all of them, we would find one that has an almost perfect correlation, because there are just so many. So how, is, is that then the correct one? Yes, so how do you decide? Well, exactly. So how do you decide when to stop? Um, if you look at the correlation, there's an obvious trend from the scatter plot of something that you might try, like an exponential. Um, then um, you try that, and you just trust that this might be correct. If it fits very well, um, you can argue that that's a valid model. You don't know whether it's mechanistically correct, but at least it explains your data. In a sense, that's what statisticians mean by uh, modeling data, not knowing anything about the mechanism, but, but explaining it with, in a functional form so that the residuals against the fit of the functional form become very small. Um, so on the other hand, you might have an idea about the mechanism. You might have an idea that you know this is, <clears throat> say, gene expression, which you can model according, an according to an impulse model for which you have published data on what that impulse model would look like. Or this is um, you know, some kind of logistic function um, that, that varies in a, in, a, in a sigmoidal fashion between 0 and 1. And if you have an idea about the mechanism or how that data should present itself, then by all means you can do a nonlinear least squares fit and, and, and try to, uh, to present that data. We'll, we'll look briefly at uh, nonlinear least squares fits later on. But in principle, what, what, what we do in, in practice is using some of the standard models like linear, exponential, where we have reason to believe that the data actually behaves in that way because of the biological um, context that we know that our data comes from. So here you chose 50 data points, right? Yeah. Um, so what if you had five or five hundred? What are your considerations? Um, given the script that we have, that's something that's very easy for you to try. Just change the value in the script and then pursue this through five or 500 data points. Fundamentally, what you'll see, if the number of data points becomes very small, then our fit becomes very uncertain. If it becomes very large, then the fit becomes more and more accurate. Um, if it's something like a 1,000, I, I would virtually guarantee to find the correct parameters. So um, we were looking at um, prediction intervals and confidence intervals. Usually when you, when you see scatter plots published, you only see the red line, the regression line. The information in these dotted lines is, is really, really important as well. So if you do it right and you do it well, um, you add this to your regression plot. Um, your referees will be very grateful because they will know that they're dealing with an author who is careful about their data and gives um, readers an idea about how, um, how convincing the results are. So essentially, the line is the regression line. The inner boundaries are um, kind of where the regression line could move to and God, I don't know what the limit is. I think 5%, 95% of all, all, all cases of randomness at, at, at that year would allow the line to lie in this region, um, whereas the outer um, lines are the boundaries of where we would expect unobserved points, i.e. new probands that we add to the data set to lie given the parameters that we've already seen. So this is the proper way to plot a linear regression. 
the possible range of the models. And yeah, right, so it's the 95% confidence interval that we're plotting here. Um, predict takes as a parameter which confidence interval you want to choose. The default is 95%. Now, um, I don't want to go into nonlinear least square fits immediately. There's about a thousand lines of code here, by the way, so we'll only um, get through about 800 of these before five. Um, but I would like you to try some regression tasks here. So we'll, we'll write up a task. I'd like you to try <clears throat> um, a scatter plot and a linear least squares fit of expression data from our LPS DAT analysis. Um, so data columns should we use? Danielle, which cell lines would you expect to behave similarly? Or which, which cell types would you behave, expect to behave similarly to LPS studies? So B cells, NKs, homocytes, and rich cells. Maybe uh, cells, cells will always I don't know. Uh, try NK cells, maybe? NK cells and what? Like, I need a pair of cells. That, uh, kind of. The bone chain? No, that, that we expect to do kind of a similar thing in response to the NK cells. Oh, uh, but what uh, would be I think? Monocytes? Well, there's so much data. Hmm? There's, there's so much data. OK, let's do macrophages and monocytes. So, Let's, let's have a hypothesis <clears throat> and say in our LPS data, um, what were the macrophages anyway? Do we have macrophages? MF. MF, M oh yeah, MF, MF and MO. Um, ought to respond similarly to LPS challenge. If so, the LPS minus control data should be highly correlated. Is that the case? Plot the scatter plot for this hypothesis. Calculate. <coughs> Assess um, whether there is a linear relation correlation for twenty marks. Do you still wake up from time to time and <laughs> think, oh my god, I haven't done my homework? <laughs> All right.
So what do we do about that? Well, we don't start writing code. In a little task like that, first step is to understand what we are doing and break it down step by step by step. So how do we break this down step by step? What's the first step we would, we would possibly do? We need to calculate, we have to pull the data to then calculate the differences between the control and LPS. Okay. So, um, Calculate the stimulation values. For MF and MO. <coughs> Assign them to some variable. Then. Plot um, calculate correlation calculate the linear model plot AB line of the linear model plot PP and PC intervals to make the plot nice. It's kind of all laid out here. The thing with the ordering of values might not be so obvious, but you should be able just to copy the code and plug in the variables that you have and arrive at that. And then, of course, um, this is way down at the black, at the whiteboard. You, you can't see it. It's hidden behind this here. I'll be standing in front of it so you don't see it. So you have to engrave it into your heart instead, which is a very good idea. Interpret your data. Before you interpret your analysis, it is not complete. Just spitting out a few numbers without writing into your journal what these numbers mean, um, you're not done. If you don't interpret your data, you are performing cargo cult bioinformatics, not the real thing, or cargo cult science can't lead to anything good because it's just numbers. Without you know, thinking about what the numbers mean and writing that down, you are not done. So interpret. You can't see it from where you're sitting, so do engrave it into your heart. <coughs> Interpretation is required to make your analysis complete. All right. Um, <coughs> yeah, write some code for that. and. Um, if you're done, put up a blue post-it. If you don't even know how to begin, put up a red post-it right now. <laughs> and if you, if you know how to begin and um, you get stuck, then put up a red post-it at that time. Good. I see a few red post-its already. That's great. That's what we're here for, and that's what you're here for. So, I'm going to start from scratch. <laughs> I understand the task. So, 
And so we want to take these two cell lines that have been, and there's some control. Yeah, I assume, I guess, that we're tested in terms of whether or not they have been solved. So we want to try to um, read every single one of Charlie. What's the size of that difference? The difference of plot. So we're going to be doing this basically. So we want to take the treatment minus the control for energy. So it subtracts the function. So we're going to go into our first one in a second and we'll extract that color. <laughs> something to take kind of similar to what we did in our practice example. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to try that. For okay, great. Long. And like, just let me know if you feel like that.
Okay, uh, Tracy just raised an excellent point. Um, what's in a rose that, which we call a rose by any other name would be just as sweet. Um, so what we, how we apply this here is um, with this, we're calculating confidence limits. With this, we're calculating uh, prediction limits. If I call them PP and, uh, and PC in, in the other way around, that doesn't mean that 
they're somehow different. It's just that I messed up uh, <laughs> labeling them. So this, this should be PC, and this should be PP, and um, yeah. Thank you, Tracy. But it doesn't really matter how, how you call it. You might just be confused when you, when you plot it. So confidence and prediction. How many things are going well? Because we're going well. And now we're just sideways. This is the second situation. Um, so obviously, my segment is not falling. In a way that makes sense. Because we're not going to sit to the other ones. It's possible. It's very busy here. It is, but like, no. So if you're done with that and you want to explain some more, my resident expert um, suggests to compare NK cells against dendritic cells because they have quite different functions. Nobody can see that. NK and PDCs. See whether that looks the same or different. So first I have to so put the Yes. 
Still need all those things. Yeah, just change to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But you can have the comments. Thank you. I probably see it. Yeah. I switched it, but I switched it back and forth. Oh, you switched it back. Oh, I see. Yeah. 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 And then the same thing, but for the different What are you doing? Why are you doing So they actually did was just to make a So now, so now it's taken back to a single And then they try to see whether the speech Yeah, so then look at the the Yeah, Did anybody produce this plot uh, for MK and PDC? Oh, okay. Ah, yeah, exactly. Well, <laughs> it's perfect. It is perfect, but that's because of this. So you use oh, this minus wax. No, no, just the jokes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Your score is going to be expected. So, yeah. So, why used to say this? Okay. But now, why is the same as X? So, just. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So, this one also has to be. This is the the other form of yeah. things, just to fix. <coughs> uh, what what I've seen across the room is um, you guys are doing really well. I, most of you were able to do the plot and uh, calculate the regression line and calculate correlations. Correlation is around 0.6 for the um, macrophages and monocytes. I've seen correlations around 0.57 for the NK cells and PDCs, and that's slightly less, but um, not very much. I don't know whether that's significantly less. But it, it would be expected to be slightly less if the cells are different. So what does that mean? How do you interpret this? There's a strong linear correlation. Uh, Sarah did calculate the residuals. The residuals are almost perfectly zero. There's a very strong linear correlation, which perfectly explains the relationship between stimulation values for these different cell types. So what does that mean? Biology, not mathematics. 
that the cells, the two different types of cells, are responding decently similarly to the change in condition? Right. So, but what does the response mean in principle? Let's break that down. So, a single row or a single data point means what? Change in gene expression. Change in gene expression for a single gene. So you have like a similar global expression response. Exactly. So we have a similar global expression response across the 1,300 genes that we're looking at here for stimulation to LPS. Is that something we expect? That was our hypothesis. Yeah. I, mean, I don't work in this, but... <laughs> well, is, is that something that you'd expect? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, they all seem to kind of the same receptor. I think it's a TLA, TLA receptor 4 or something like that. So you um, would I, don't, I don't know. I don't know whether that's the case. I mean, remember the distributions we saw of what these simulated values are in the first place. Most of them are kind of around a mean and, and simply a stochastic correlation. This means these, most of these genes don't respond to LPS at all. Mm -hmm. And that stays the same between, um, between um, whatever the cell types are. So I would actually expect differential effects only in the small subset of genes that are, in fact, differentially expressed. So I'm not very surprised, but, you know, I, I didn't know how this will turn out. I'm not very surprised that we have a good global correlation because these are just human cells and they behave in similar ways. But there would be differences if, if I know or if I can find out which ones are actually significantly differentially expressed, perhaps I would see more differences there. So that's where I would look next in this interpretation, right? Daniel, am I saying something wrong? You're, you're looking critical. If I, have a, if I have a biology expert in the room, I'm always <laughs> super careful about what I say. Yeah? But we are not like commenting on how many genes are expressed. We're just comparing if the same genes are over and under expressed in different cell types, right? Right. Line. So given that uh, those like cells are all in eight million types of expressed, how you start your <laughs> Okay. Well, it doesn't necessarily mean that the, that the absolute values of the expression change are means. It just means if I have a random gene, it responds in the same way between macrophages and monocytes. It doesn't necessarily mean that that change is in any way means. So there would be perhaps some global expression change effects, non-specific effects, you know, that, that, that might be active. Um, uh, and that would be shown here. We just change the data. That would be my next question that I would ask to the data. Are we, am, am I just seeing, you know, general biology as action here? The correlation is high because they're all human cells or all blood cells. Um, or does it actually mean they it's respond to LPS in the same way? If I want to ask, do they respond to LPS in the same way? I need to stratify my data differently, stratify between the genes that are actually differentially expressed just to see the that's consistent, and that's what you were talking about. So that oh, how do we, I, I don't know if we're going to get there, kind of get to the point where we say, okay, well, what are the, the ones that actually are responding? Well, that, that in, in principle, you already have the tools for that, because in our subset analysis, we picked out um, subsets of genes that respond strongly, that have strong differential expression. So if you do that, so this um, is going to be. You basically take the subset of the 100 100 strongest responders in one cell, yeah. as so one hundred strongest live responders live in the live other cell, to get the union of that and first then analysis yeah. separately. Like it's always the Then we would see a very significant difference. 
Thank you. Like, I don't you know, just see, I, like, I haven't done this, but you know, this is where I would go next. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you see something about your data, data your bio, and so is this in some ways significant? What does my child tell me about that? Is that's that something that's about the like, like, uh, 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 and come up with some of the questions well? Are we even looking at responding? We think there, maybe not. And then just put why come back. Okay, maybe we should be scrapping. You don't want to say it. I'm already top one. Uh, for where they fall in with in front of the one. So we see an understanding that all and then we see the data and you see what the data and then you can start displaying it in different things. No, no, no. So like where you were before. So like right in front of the bracket. It's the same as this. It's just you doing that there. So predict bracket and align. It's not necessarily expressed in the sense that that uh, effect okay. of the yeah. 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 means numbers there. Actually, different numbers there. Numbers so, like, right there, in front of the Y. So, like, the lines are going through the wrong direction. Like, wrong numbers are. Like, right before the bracket, before the Y. So, Y, bracket, <laughs> so you're doing like exactly <laughs> this, yeah, yeah, yeah. Except yeah. instead of these so values, you're you putting in Y now. You don't do an analysis. You don't have an analysis. In your model. Do your analysis and the question. Except the uh, work. But, but that's how they are described in the state. We are saying that uh, those are the most variable genes. Then, oh, this is LM. It's not yeah. by LM. And then uh, instead of the comma there. Yeah. And you want if we, to, to, if we remember that this is where the changes is that means very small like model that So your model is wide oh, by that. Yeah. Yeah. Group around I, this. So that's that one. I was like, maybe my LM. Yes, Dad. So the number of actually yeah, exactly. differentially expressed genes, I would doubt that we have a yeah. thousand yeah. differently So that's nice. We've, we've, we've seen that we can apply statistical models like linear correlations to data. And we can start exploring data with, with these models. What, what I want to briefly discuss is the idea that we can use such linear or, or such models as, as descriptors of our data. So rather than looking at raw expression values, we can start correlating the data with a model and then individually and then start subsetting our data by how well they fit to a particular model. And I'll take you through a little bit of the code. This takes us into nonlinear least squares fit because um, the code is based on yeast gene expression profiles from cell cycle expression data. So the data set that we're working with here is derived from GSE 365. Um, this is from the GEO database, <coughs> published in 2006, uh, Saccharomyces alpha factor cell cycle. Uh, cells were synchronized with alpha factor and then sampled every 10 minutes across two cell cycles total of 13 samples were analyzed, uh, Pramila et al. So this is a yeast cell cycle expression data set across two cell cycles. 
And of course, if you do a cell cycle expression data set, you'd like to find genes that are actually cyclically expressed, i.e. that correspond in some way to the cell cycle. So there's two um, data sets <coughs> which I've kind of pre-prepared from the geo data and from gene data that I've downloaded from, uh, from uh, SGD, the Saccharomyces Genome Database. Uh, one is in YG profiles, yeast gene profiles, one is in yeast gene data. The yeast gene profiles is derived from the actual expression values. There are 6,228 rows in that data, i.e. in principle, one for every yeast gene, um, and 25 columns. So T0, T5 minutes, T10 minutes, and so on for the entire cell. So these are not you know, categorically different expression values like the ones we had in our LPS data set. These are expression profiles along a timeline. Each of the rows in this data set corresponds to the variation of expression of, it, of one gene across two cell cycles. Uh, YG data is a data set which has a few annotations. Um, <clears throat> So what I've, what I've put in here is the SGD um, ID for the gene. The systematic name, the systematic name is, is important because that's what we can cross-reference to our um, YG profiles. The way the profiles come down from uh, the GEO database is they have systematic names. So when I see a yeast systematic name, it doesn't tell me anything. If, if I see a yeast gene name, it sometimes tells me a little bit more, sometimes. But um, we can correlate that. So for every one of these systematic names here, uh, we hope to have an explanation in our YG data file, what is the, um, the standard name for the gene and what's the alias and what is the description of the, of the name. So um, FUN14 has an alias of M MCP3. It's an integral mitochondrial outer membrane protein, a dosage suppressor of an MDM10 null, and so on. So there's a lengthy description there. So these things are su supremely useful. Um, if you do, again, exploratory data analysis and you find clusters or, 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 or dots or whatever, the next thing you always ask yourself is, well, what are these? If you're doing uh, analysis of genes and um, your analysis just spits out the row numbers in the matrix, that's not going to tell you a whole lot. So you need some kind of an annotation prepared that you can then correlate with your data and figure out, you know, Seven of these 10 genes are mitochondrial genes. So yeah, that's something significant, or things like that. So the annotation part is important. This is why we were harping around on data annotation so much in the, in the first part of this workshop. So this is one of these expression data sets. I'm randomly picking out um, <clears throat> one of the profiles. This is the expression profile. The row name of that is YBL005W, um, and YBL005W. I've arranged them so that the row names correspond to each other. You don't need to, to cross-reference them by, um, by the actual name or the actual identifier, so the gene for which we have a row, uh, an expression profile in row 123 is the gene for which we have data in row 123 of that other data set. Now in this case, using correlation analysis for exploring data sets, seeing that we're interested in genes that have a certain behavior, for example, that the gene is cyclically expressed, how could we find them? Well. For example, we could define a model for our expression profiles and then search for genes that correlate with this model. 
So we take all these expression profiles, and rather than you know, doing something purely mathematical, we say we have a biological model. This, these are two cell cycles, so if I have a cyclically expressed gene, it should correlate with a cosine function or a sine function of two waves. And that's something we can, we can just compute. So um, if we build t as a vector of sequences, like our time points, going from 0 to 120 by 5 minutes, uh, we get the 25 values of time points. <clears throat> then we can calculate some model, for example, the cosine of t divided by 60 times 2 pi. And we can look at what that looks like. So this is a completely synthetic model built from first principles where we say, you know, if this is a cyclical like flesh genes, I would expect it to vary in this way. So can we use this as um, a fishing hook? to pull out genes from our soup that actually look like that. Now we can easily calculate the correlation of a real expression profile with our synthetic profile. So for example, take row 815. This is what row 815 looks like. And we can calculate the correlation, which is minus 0 0.9. Ooh, that's a very strong correlation, actually. It's a very strong anti-correlation, I should say. Or if we look at row 5,571 and plot that and calculate the correlation, plus 0.86. So this is very highly correlated. So with this simple correlation analysis, I've discovered two cyclically expressed genes without doing anything else, simply defining a model that is able to filter out data from our profiles of expressions that um, somehow look like the data in that model. Now, the amplitude of our synthetic profile does not matter because uh, the correlation does not depend on the factor of the linear relationship. Um, so if we want to calculate correlations for all profiles, we build ourselves a little vector for my correlations, which has as space for the values we derive from every single row. And then we write a little for loop. And for every one of the 6,000 rows, we calculate the coefficient of correlation and put that into the vector. And done quite fast. No, actually, I didn't even do it yet. Here, there we go. Still done. Um, so what do we get? So this is the histogram of correlations. The bulk of them is around zero, but there's quite many that are very significantly correlated and very significantly um, anti-correlated. So some of the correlations are very high. If we plot the 10 highest correlations and the 10 highest anti-correlations, um, that's very easy to do. We build a selection vector 1 and 2, which is ordering this in a decreasing sense or in an, uh, in an increasing, wait, wait, in a decreasing sense and in an increasing sense, as we've done before, and then just pulling out the 10 largest values of, of either kind. And we can list the genes that we have here. So these are the 10 most highly correlated ones. Um, <clears throat> I don't actually recognize any of these. SPO12 would be a sporulation gene, perhaps something that we could expect in the cell cycle somewhere. Um, the highest anti-correlations. Um, Manosyl transferases are um, have functions in building cell walls. So again, that's something that I would expect to 
be switched on and off during the cell cycle. Um, right, and we can plot the expression profiles and see that indeed, well, as expected, um, we find genes that are cyclically expressed by fishing them out with, um, with, that, with that approach. So model-based um, correlations are easy to compute and we'll of course find profiles that correlate with the models. Um, moreover, however, we would not find genes that are phase shifted because these have near zero correlations. So if we have, if you assume that one of these is a transcription factor, we wouldn't find the transcription factor targets because they're expressed after the peaks of the transcription factors. So if we shift the model by 15 minutes, for example, and, and plot that, so these are the shifted model and the normal model. And um, these are, um, this, is, this is one expression profile. If we calculate the correlation with one model, um, it's actually the other way around. Um, one of the correlations is 0.18, and the other correlation is minus 0.03, i.e. virtually nothing. So, so this depends, which means we could build a family of such models and start searching um, by just shifting them for all of the correlations. But we could also do something different. We could take every line, every row of expression profiles and fit the parameters for a model. So if we say, well, this is, this is a, we're looking for cyclically ex expressed genes, let's take the model of a curve with, of, of, of a sine wave or a cosine function with parameters of amplitude, phase. <coughs> um, yeah? In a way, you're, you're going into this analysis with, with a certain assumption or bias, right? Which means you postulate a model and then fish for genes to fit your model, right? Yep. And so if I went into this and had no clue, though, that there was a certain cycle to all of these genes, mm -hmm. how would I go into this? How would I analyze that to try to figure out that a pattern like that exists, right? Would I go through all of the 5,000 lines and basically when, when we talk about um, uh, dimension reduction tomorrow, we'll, we'll revisit that. So in principle, with principal correlation, and uh, principal component analysis, we can find um, patterns that correspond to the strongest variances in data sets like that. And so you, you can basically pull out the prototypically varying genes some sense, um, and and then just look at the curve and see you know what's the function form that we have here, um, and we will probably see that we see uh, curves that are just generally decaying or, or increasing in, in expression, and other curves that that actually are cyclically regulated. So <clears throat> these are essentially the low lying fruit. If we do this analysis with the question of well, will we find psychically expressed genes? A psychically expressed gene, by definition, should be similar to, to a sine wave or a cosine wave, so we can use that as a model and already fit that out. Does it mean we'll find anything that's interesting? No. So didn't you also set a certain periodicity? Yeah. So that things could... Right, because the description of the GSC data set tells me this were two cell cycles. Right. So over the time here, I subdivided such that I have two sine waves. Right. Right. But once again, that is something I can I can also fit with a nonlinear least squares fit. I can fit amplitude, phase, and frequency. So I, if I add these three parameters to a model description, I can now go into every single profile and, and get the best fit for amplitude, phase, and and frequency. And then I can store that description. 
And that's now a new descriptor of my data, these parameters. And then I can ask which genes have um, frequencies, whatever amplitude and phase is and how they look in, in, in principle, which genes have frequencies that are close to two? Which genes have frequencies that are close to one? Are there any that skip a cell cycle? Which genes have phases that correspond to them being high initially and low later? Which genes have phases where they are switched on um, at some time point in the cell cycle? So at that point, I'm not looking at the raw data anymore. I'm looking at a higher level, at, at an interpretation of the data. And I'm doing my exploratory data analysis with parameters of a curve and I get the parameters from non-linear least squares. Yeah? Are you also able to do like a uh, factor variable? So let's say you have a, not regarding to this data set, you have like two conditions and you want to relate the genes that are mostly correlated with one condition versus another condition. Yeah, 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 of course. So I can I can regress some categorical variables as well. Yeah. Right. So I, I could include these in these ones. So, <coughs> In the something like, um, nine hundred lines of code that follow here, that's exactly what we do. Um, in the final two minutes of today, I'm not going to go through nine hundred lines of code. <laughs> I'll just leave this as something for you to explore. I think it should be reasonably uh, self-explanatory from the code that I've, that I've um, supplied here. Um, so just you know, roll with it and, and try to understand what's going on at some point in time. I've explained the principle, though. If we, if we explore our data with regression analysis, we're not simply confined to particular models. We can basically abstract the whole idea of regression analysis and say, well, let's derive data of how well or what parameters we get for any particular model that we can define. And then we can do our filtering and selection on the model parameters rather than just looking at the, at the actual data. So basically, it's, it's um, um, kind of building a computational telescope of where we transform the data in a way where <clears throat> the things that we're looking for become more obvious. <clears throat>